It's a pleasure to be here. Can a peace dividend and devolution transform business in Northern Ireland lessons from the UK's fastest growing economy? Um, this is the structure of the presentation. Possible lessons from the Milton Keynes City region, I termed it, which is now this area known as Southeast Midlands Local Enterprise Partnership. It's the fastest growing um, sub-region in the UK. Um, in the context of exploiting the peace dividend and further devolution, now, I feel like I'm some emissary across the pond who's coming to tell you that all you need is smart specialization or smart cities or Michael Porter or Richard Florida. I don't propose to do that, but I think it's always interesting to learn from other places and think about it in context. I'm a Londoner, but there's, I've been doing a lot of work recently on the Milton Keynes sub-region. I think there's a lot um, of interesting stuff going on there that's not just dependent on the kind of cities that... Um, or which is in their hinterland, which is Birmingham and London. Okay, so just to talk quickly about uh, realising a peace dividend. Um, you can see that the evidence is often difficult because it's what if, counterfactual reason reasoning. Um, and I'm going to give a couple of slides on Iraq. I recently did some work for the Ministry of Planning in Iraq. It's first outlined spatial strategy, forecasting economic growth, uh, and employment to 2030. Uh, but in Northern Ireland, there's two recent, relatively recent pieces of evidence. Tim Besley, who was on the Monetary Policy Committee in the UK, found that uh, as a result of um, the well, peace dividend, for want of a better word, house prices in Belfast grew by 4 to 12 percent, 0.8 to 2.5 percent over all other regions in Northern Ireland. And in regard to tourist investment and real investment associated with it, there was risk premium from reported fatalities uh, was higher, and the investment and tourism has tended to return to, um, pre to, to trend and rising. But as we've seen in many societies, uh, the basis of conflict is often socioeconomic inequality. And suddenly the IMF and the OECD, following the history of an idea that doesn't work, which is austerity, we're reducing inequality actually may lead to growth through increased equity to a larger overall um, economic welfare. Equity, in a sense, is about increase, increasing the size of economic welfare, and efficiency is about the rate of change in its distribution. And if there's a false division between them, they're, they're both related. Now... Just quickly, this is an evaluation framework for a peace dividend that was taken from an EU project that was finished in about 2012. Evaluation frameworks are important in anything. I'll come on to it on the, the case study, in that you can actually also have a kind of evaluation framework for the economic dividend of devolution and further devolution. Now, in the work we did for Iraq, this is just conflict on, conflict off. This, in red... <coughs> The annual, um, the annual rate of growth, and it hasn't come up for some reason, but it was minus 0.13% over that period. Before that, partly to do with the oil boom, it was 10.8%. This is taken from the regional projections. This figure on the left is Iraqi dinars, and this is the base case that the government is assuming. But the assumptions are very much about a greater share of non oil activity and investment, but that you actually have long-run stability. And clearly, Iraq is not, Northern Ireland is not like Iraq, but clearly the longest-run stability, the greater devolution in Northern Ireland is contributing to a pickup in its activi act economic activity and sustainability. Now, the relationship between um, devolution and economic growth is a complex one. But most of the evidence shows that federal states grow faster uh, than in unitary centralised states, sorry, um, is statistically significant. But more importantly, there's lower transaction costs, the, cost, the administrative costs, the cost of doing business in operating localised economic policy. But tax administration may be more efficient at national level. Combination of governmental, fiscal, institutional policy enables growth opportunities, and it leads to um, allocative and productive efficiencies allied to greater accountability and participation in decision-making, and creates an economic dividend. Now, in deference to Sartre, 
I heard about knowledge management. We, we have a knowledge management sector in our business school. But localized data architecture, or regionalized data architecture, and appropriate knowledge management helps to inform policy decisions more intelligently. And in Scotland in particular, compared to England, there's a lot more economic data, a lot more knowledge within the economic service in Scotland, and they've worked closely with academics at Strathclyde University, to, to enable to say something about the effects of policy interventions and what their outcomes are. Uh, there's, I'm a Londoner, and, there's a, in, and um, this isn't Chatham House, but I think a lot of the claims for boosting London against the other regions is bad politics, but it's bad economics. London gets enormous explicit and implicit subsidies. And the view somehow that you make London grow and the rest <coughs> of the UK benefits is nonsense. I could use a stronger word. But actually, when you look at the data sets in London, they're pretty poor. The study they did, the LDA, did on creative industries, employment count. The biggest employment count was people who worked in DVD hire shops. DVD hire shops. Well, is that retail or is it creative industries? But it was this kind of boosterism and saying, oh, we'll put it in that category. Um, it's not very good statistics. It's not very good analysis. Now, setting your own corporation tax um, <coughs> is useful, and I personally would be in favour of it, as part of devolution. But you have to be careful about the effects and what the drivers are. And I read the excellent report that the Research and in, uh, Information Service did on devolution corporation. I thought it was a very good study. Very thoughtful, very nu nuanced. I would make stronger conclusions, but I can do that as an academic. I don't serve a, um, a wider community in that sense. Now, the tale of two regional economies. Um, you know much more than I do about Northern Ireland, but what's interesting is that you've got Belfast as, as the core on the coast with a large hinterland that's rural, whereas Milton Keynes is the centre of this wider sub-region, two motor, motorways, major links, um, and a GVA for 2013, about a third larger in, in both cases. Both have s similar populations, both have similar kind of characteristics and capacities and capabilities, particularly things like you. I mean, Northern Ireland, you have the best sustainable rates of enterprise. You have a young, well-educated um, population comparatively to other regions. So there's, 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 there's an interesting set of parallels there. So let's go on to Milton Keynes, and let's get past the caricature that it hosts the Open University that only does degrees for housewives, which I find offensive to women, and I find it offensive to the university, but that's another story. Or it's just full of roundabouts or concrete cows. It's a complex, very interesting place. So it um, has developed this competitive and comparative advantage that's global outside of London, and the linkages it's got through logistics, through foreign direct investment. It doesn't rest on London. It doesn't rest on um, Birmingham. And in fact, if you look at uh, flows of goods just through logistics, from Milton Keynes down to Southampton, it's quite actually interesting, those kind of linkages. They're quite powerful. If, if you just want to get trade data, from Milton, it doesn't go through London. It doesn't go through Felix, though. It goes through Southampton. So it's actually telling you something about the capacity of that economy. Now, although it's dominated by logistics, and we've got lots of sheds, and you can drive around the roundabouts, I still get lost after 13 years. Behind logistics is a complex global economy. ICT, financial technical services, um, and also you've got Formula One, advanced engineering, Nissan, Mercedes, <coughs> and aerospace. Now, what's interesting is that aerospace is being pushed as an activity of future growth and development in Milton Keynes but it's not as advanced or it has as much capacity as in Northern Ireland, which people forget. Bombardier, BAE, uh, and linkage to those kind of uh, activities. And even famous Harlander Wharf, you know, shipbuilding, ship repair. But the basis of those industries actually give you links into global high-tech linkages if you develop them. And there are linkages between um, aerospace and shipping that people often overlook terms of ICT, in terms of knowledge management. And one of the ironies is that um, 
Apparently, shipping was finished worldwide. Why would you invest in shipping? You know, what you need is service <coughs> industries, you know, lighter than air industries. That's the light and the way. You had a commodities boom. If you go to Broome in Australia, look at all the iron ore ships. Go to Shanghai. Shipping, and sh you know, is boomed. Okay, the commodity boom's coming to an end. But suddenly you had this traditional industry generating global demand with quite sophisticated systems behind it. But it was ships, you know, big, large amounts of iron ore because they were the ingredients to build things. You've got four universities and central universities. Um, but what's quite interesting is, and I'll show you some of the data quickly, is that there's a real economic dividend going on in Milton Keynes because they've built more houses, which is what they should do in London and the southeast. Is it supply constraint? And with rising GVA per head, and it's attractive to young families, you're actually getting a real income effect for the people who move there. I'm personally going to, I'm a dyed in the wall urbanite, I'm probably too old, but. Uh, so this is changing the numbers of uh, employees um, over the period. Um, again, it's in the presentation, uh, which is well, the cleaner version on the website. But this is perhaps more interesting, that the annual rate of growth for those, that period is about 2.6%, which is not quite double the UK average. But what you can see is the changes there. I mean, agriculture, don't look at the percentages, it's the absolute number, is that this starts to take on the appearance of what's called a service economy. I was talking to Sandra earlier, and being an ICT person, she gave me the perfect answer, which is, is software a service or a manufacturer? And she had both, and I said, absolutely. And that's what I ask all students. And you see, you know, so the linkage between services and manufacturing are powerful. 75% of research and development in the UK is accounted for by manufacturing. But manufacturing is not some you know, guy out in a garden shed with a lathe. It's, it's a complex set of things, and it's, it's linked. And again, there's a lot of nonsense talked about financial services um, which around London, which actually accounts only for 8% of GDP in the UK, but not many people apparently know that. So if you look at the percentage of local businesses in the Milton Keynes City region, you can see two sort of large clusters which seem to correspond to advanced economies um, around professional scientific technical services, <coughs> business administration, and support services. But a lot of those are linked to advanced engineering, advanced manufacturing, which doesn't employ as many people, but actually creates more value added. Now, I was a bit disappointed to read the Northern Ireland Economic Strategy, which told me that financial services are high value-added activity. And I thought, hmm. Actually, aerospace gives you higher value-added. Lots of these other activities do. Financial services give higher value-added to certain people, usually getting large bonuses, just that, like in uh, higher education. Higher education, most of the value-added is created by the, uh, the academics and the other employees not the senior management who pay themselves large sums of money. Um, I did say that. But what's interesting about the two areas, if you look at the strategic priorities for the economic strategy of Semlet, the city region, and for um, Northern Ireland, they're very similar. What I thought was interesting, though, that although it talks about aerospace, the bottom two, advanced materials and advanced engineering, is now at the centre of aerospace. Um, I w I, I'll probably be dead by the time they make the first graphene plane, but it would be interesting to see. And I'm sure, like the Titanic, um, it may be first done in Belfast. This is GVA per head in Northern Ireland and the Semlet region. And you can see that at the top is Belfast, but as you um, go down, the outer areas of, of the other sorry, regions of Northern Ireland tend to be at the bottom. But you can see in the middle, the middle set, if you look closely, is all around the regions that abut Milton Green's city region, so the, the southeast, the east, East Midlands, and so on. And, and that, so that, in a sense, is, is not surprising. The challenge is how can that structure 
that kind of development be, um, which appears to be successful, developed in somewhere like Northern Ireland. Now, clearly, there are the, is the capacities and the capabilities to do that. But geography matters, spatial structures matter, and also the degree of local decision-making matters in what you can actually do. And that's the age population. As you can see, um, younger population peaking, you'd expect that. But if you actually see that the family formation, particularly in Milton Keynes, is, is starting to rise again. It tends to be low in some of the sort of rural areas, as one would expect. Now, I put up economically inactive. You can see it's mainly the urban regions of Milton Keynes, Bedford, um, Luton, England as, as a whole. Now, that's an issue in any region, but even one is apparently successful in Milton Keynes. There's an issue about how you reach socially excluded people in terms of their participation in labour force or in setting up their own businesses. So Milton Keynes is... But that, there's a variety of reasons. When you drive around Milton Keynes, it's a bit like driving around Los Angeles. You think, oh, this looks nice, pleasant. But what you associate with sort of ghettos and poor areas, you often can't identify in, North, in say, Los Angeles. You can't identify them in um, Milton Keynes so easily from just driving around. Same in London, same in Belfast. Now, I just want to bring quickly the case study. I've been recently working on a, a project on the economic impact of sport in Milton Keynes. This is from the International Sporting City, uh, from a study that was done, three-legged stool. I'd actually do something a bit more um, complex than that, but you can actually see that uh, the, the kind of linkages they're trying to. Now, this is the strategic pr priorities of the International Sporting City. I won't go through them all, but in terms of comparative lessons, it's the last two. Inward investment, wider area, opportunities to engage. Secondly, in terms of jobs, economic prosperity, etc. Et et That's a diagram I came up with. Shows my I started my career in engineering. But this is something about I call the activity complex economy. Now, an activity complex economy is the, is the final um, version of what's called an agglomeration economy. Localization economies form of agglomeration, sorry, are things like like firms, firms in the same sector located in the same area because of uh, specialised labour force, access to markets. Urbanisation economies are where you get, unlike industries, located together, so a city like Belfast, and again because of um, access to market, transport infrastructure, in business environment and so on and so forth. And the activity complex is... is the combination of the, well, it's, it adds up and it includes important trading links. So you've got the economic impact of sport. And along the bottom here, you've got, I would argue that sport actually integrates these sectors. Look at just sports direct. You know, people buy sports clothes just to wear, but it's associated with certain things. But also health and education. So the, cap the capacities and capabilities are what we call community capitals, sports organisations, facilities, infrastructure, but international centres of excellence, but also international events. And you've had the Giro Italia here recently. Those things are important. Not, in, you know, not just to market the place, but look at the kind of linkage, economic linkages out of that. Sport is seen as something that we'll all be watching avidly at 5 o'clock on, on Saturday. Now, community capitals and sports clusters, this is the types of capital that comes from the... Um, French sociologist Bourdieu's work, uh, Seven Forms of Economic Capital, and they're defined in the, in the presentation. And what we did was match them uh, with the kind of definition uh, about sports, and then we gave examples of sports clusters. Now, this is actually important for an evaluation framework. And what we did, and this came from a, a study of actually using electronic government services uh, impact on social exclusion number of European cities is what this petal diagram. And you could actually use this evaluation technique for any intervention. They say it's small. Habitat is your sort of local area, cultural and social institutional norms. It could be Belfast, um, could be Coleraine, could be Jordanstown. And you have all the needs of this human capital. 
So the argument would be, say, for example, you built a new stadium um, and you move Tottenham there, which I think is a very good idea. Then the infrastructure capital you need to begin with, but at subsequent stages you wouldn't need that. But it would increase organisational capital, so that petal would grow. It would increase environment and social envi and reputational. You may need less financial capital. So <clears throat> you start off with that, a range of these community capitals. You have an intervention. Some will grow and some you'll need less of over time. And it's a useful <coughs> way of looking at um, evaluation. Sports as a local economic game changer. Um, you've got these national events, you've got sports activity complex, integrates leisure, retail, culture, health and education sector. It's entering the 2017 European City of Cultural Competition, even though it's not a, um, it's not a city. <clears throat> but the Smart Cities project, they're, they're sharing all the data amongst the stakeholders. And what's happened is the creation of the South East Midlands Local Eco Enterprise Partnership is actually created an identity uh, uh, over and above the core. Before, it's like, we hate Milton Keynes if we're in Northampton, or we hate Bedford. But it's actually lower transaction costs. People are sharing information and realise there's a mutuality of interest. And that's where the knowledge management and data architecture comes in. And a partnership basis. Peace, dividend, difficult to measure, but it shows it has positive outcomes. There's um, equity and efficiency gains from a peace and economic dividend. Coordinating regional economic policy. Lessons to be learned is important, but the implementation is important, but the context is crucial. You don't need Richard Florida to tell you about creative classes. You don't need Michael Porter <coughs> to tell you that. But it's actually always worth looking at other places. But as an exemplar of a kind of integrative concept that links a range of sectors more effectively to sustain the economy. So the contribution of sport at the moment is 2.3% of GVA in North. But if you actually, if that's the direct contribution. We think of all the linkages in that sports activity complex, leisure, retail, culture, health, education. It could actually make a major contribution to sustain the economy and get its trend rate of growth up above... <coughs> Um, the UK average, and nearer to Milton Keynes. Um, so it creates effective demand, a data architecture and knowledge system, which could generate an economic div dividend. Thanks very much. Thank you.